Great. Thank you very much. I appreciate that, Rob. And I apologize for the delay in starting this session today. Uh, we, As uh, Rob mentioned, uh, we have had some uh, technical difficulties. Uh, if you were expecting to see uh, former Senator Pat Roberts from Kansas, he's having uh, some technical difficulties with his laptop. So I'm going to be stepping in today to uh, moderate the panel. Uh, today we have a session on global challenges and local solutions to transforming food systems and getting results in a global environment on behalf of CropLife International, CropLife America, and the Global Food Network, uh, Global Farmer Network. I would like to welcome you to this session. As the United Nations has gathered the world in 2021, with an ambition to transform global food systems, and as it becomes clear that we are not on track to meet the 2030 sustainability development goals during this decade of action, it is more vital than ever for a variety of former voices to be heard in these discussions. It looks like Senator Roberts has just been able to join us. And I'm not sure whether he'll be uh, coming on right now. No, I'm sorry, Mike. He has no audio right now. For for today's session, we will have a, a variety of uh, discussion uh, from our four farmers from around the world, uh, talking about the challenges they face around their farm, uh, everything from climate change and soil health to biodiversity and regulatory issues and trade issues. Uh, the, this session will include uh, videos of their uh, farmers talking on their farm and recommendations for solutions that will help transform food systems in a meaningful way for farmers, the environment, and the planet. Let's first start off with the first video from Alana Cook, who's a farmer in Canada. Hi, I'm Alana Cook, and I farm with my husband, Jerry Hertz, at Edenwall, Saskatchewan, Canada. We farm in Western Canada. We're grain producers, oilseed producers, and we also grow pulse crops. So the types of grains that we grow are wheat and durum wheat. We grow canola and flax, and we grow peas and lentils. We operate a sustainable operation here on our farm by having access to all the tools and technologies that have come to the forefront in the industry due to innovation. So we use the best genetics for our seed to ensure it's got resilience against any climate stressors, any insects, any diseases. We use crop protection products like seed treatments to ensure that the seed has the ability to germinate properly and then produce a good crop. We use pesticides to protect against crop diseases to protect against insects and of course weeds and we also use fertilizer just the right amount of fertilizer in the right targeted area to be able to maximize the production of the crop using the right rate at the right time in the right place all of this leads to our sustainable operation now when i think about sustainability the kinds of things i think about when i think of that word is i think about safe and nutritious food I think about farmers being responsible in their operations. I think about having resilience in the crop to be able to meet the changing climate and to meet the climate stressors that are always coming at us with extreme weather, heat, drought, too much moisture, that kind of thing. I think about us regenerating our soil, ensuring that we have healthy soil and we leave things better for the next generation here on the farm. And I also think about transparency in our farms to make sure that we build public trust and maintain public trust so that the public understands that we are producing sustainably and using responsible approaches to be able to produce safe, healthy, nutritious food. Now, one thing that I would like the public and people involved, for example, in food companies to know is that farmers are producing healthier, more nutritious, and more plentiful food with less than ever before. And this is because we have access to all the modern tools and technology. This ensures that we have the absolute least impact on the environment as we produce that healthy, nutritious, plentiful food. We have this targeted approach, as I mentioned, with our genetics, with our crop protection products, with our fertilizer, 
and making sure that we're making the most of the most of the moisture that we get here in Saskatchewan we're in the middle of some pretty dry farmland and with all of these tools we can ensure we can still each and every year produce a, a very good crop the other thing that I want to mention is that we've got access to you know really excellent equipment so in our case we use a minimal tillage or a zero tillage approach which means we disturb the soil the least amount that we can this preserves moisture this ensures that the quality of our soil is maintained in a very healthy way it ensures that you know there isn't soil blowing around so we don't have an air quality problem it ensures that we don't have water running off of tilled land and it ensures that we've got you know minimal impact on the environment so this more crop per drop this more resilient crop production is really what sustainability is about and i really want you know people in food companies and the public to understand that and through continuous improvement we're going to get better and better through innovation through this focus on always reducing our environmental impact while maintaining the ability to continue to farm of course with fair profitability as well because we need to be able to maintain our operation with some economic sustainability in order to continue to operate by having access to all the modern tools and technology farmers can sustainably produce healthy nutritious and plentiful food that is affordable misguided or misleading marketing approaches for food products puts this at risk it could mean that those vital tools and technology are taken away due to non-science-based decisions made by regulators, by governments around the world. And it causes consumers to feel needlessly anxious about their food. The reality is, is food is safe, safer than it's ever been. It's nutritious, more nutritious than it's ever been. And it's more affordable than it's ever been. We need to have the ability to maximize food production and minimize impact on the environment. And we can only do that by using all the tools and technology that farmers have available to them. And in this way, we can ensure environmental and economic sustainability. We know that food companies are looking to have, you know, specific characteristics in their food, specific ingredients. Farmers can meet that challenge. We can do it because of science, because of innovation, because of our adaptability and our willing to adopt these new technologies. Please allow us to do this. We know we can feed the world sustainably. We need to be able to do that by having access to all the modern tools and technology that are available to us now. Don't put that at risk. I hope you found this interesting. Greetings to you from Saskatchewan in Western Canada. From our farm here, where behind me is a beautiful crop of wheat growing for this year. Thanks very much for listening. Hey, Alana, how are you? I'm good, Michael. Good. Thank you very much for that video. I appreciate that. I really love the fact that you're in, in, your, in the field with the dog running around. Uh, it's really beautiful to see. Uh, you covered a lot in that video. Um, you know, a lot of the things that are you know, kind of the topics and themes of uh, this entire session uh, you covered in that. Um, so of all the things that you've talked about, what do you think uh, is the biggest challenge or the biggest point that you want to get across uh, to our audience today? Thanks, Michael. Um, yeah, the dog added value to the video, I think. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I realize that, you know, I think a lot of the public would think that uh, the, the things we worry about on the farm would be related to production or the weather um, or even labor or, um, you know, a lot of these things that are very operational. Frankly, I, I think the number one thing that I worry about on the farm is policy. And I, I worry about policy getting in the way of allowing us to be able to operate, uh, use sustainable practices. Um, I worry about policymakers, you know, taking away our tools, taking away the technology, standing in the way with regulatory barriers. So, you know, I, I think what's really important is, is that governments have in place good, rigorous regulation that is science-based, uh, that is stable, uh, that allows the industry to understand, you know, what rules are we playing within, what rules do farmers need to follow, uh, but don't, don't tie our hands, don't, uh, you know, don't force us to make decisions.
a very science-based regulatory system. Uh, but I worry about some of the uh, reviews of some of the current technologies, for example, and some of the pesticides that we currently use. Those are really important tools to allow us to operate sustainably because uh, you, know, you, you take some of those tools away, let's say some of the seed treatments that protect our seed when we put it in the ground. You remove that technology from us, it means we're gonna have to spray more. It means we're uh, maybe gonna have to have more tillage. Uh, this is a concern for us. And then the other example here in Canada is right now, the Canadian government is thinking, uh, you know, we're not sure where it's gonna go, but they're certainly examining the idea of bringing in a policy to reduce fertilizer use by up to 30%. This would be a massive impact, really devastating for us to be able to sustainably produce. So what we're trying to do is produce more but less, you take away the tool of fertilizer, we're not going to be able to produce as much. And it means, you know, we need more land to produce the same amount of crop that we're producing right now. So policy is my number one worry on the farm. And I know that maybe sounds crazy, but, uh, but and, and as a regulator, as a, a person who, a farmer who once served in government in, in uh, the role of the Deputy Minister of Agriculture here in Saskatchewan, uh, it's very real to me uh, that, you know, governments have, um, have a role to play to uh, be involved uh, as enabling industry and farmers, uh, but not to not to overreach. Uh, thank you very much. I, I think that is a, a going to be a, a running theme of across uh, the, the the planet uh, for some of the farmers that we talked to today. Um, I do know that we're running a little bit behind, and I think that some of the uh, the panelists and maybe some of the audience is uh, having some uh, audio issues, uh, but I think we're going to press on. Uh, uh, one one last question for you, Alana. Um, the, uh, trade is incredibly important for agriculture in the the prairie provinces, uh, just like it is for the Great Plains states in the United States. Um, how can trade help improve the uh, environmental, social, and economic sustainability of your farm? And how does trade play a bigger picture on your farm? Well, trade is really vital. I mean, here in uh, in Saskatchewan, we're the most trade dependent province in, in Canada. We have over 40% of Canada's farmland here. Uh, we're very productive. Um, you know, there, we absolutely have trade to be able to, uh, you know, ha have a market for our products. Otherwise, it would be a waste of resource. Um, having rules-based trade uh, Science-based trade uh, allows us to, you know, as I said, maintain access to tools and technology and make sure we can use sustainable practices, allowing us to have products that can be uh, exported around the world based on those, um, those science-based rules. And, you know, I, I think from a, an environmental sustainability perspective, that's really key is that it be science-based trade rules. Uh, you know, from a socially sustainable perspective, it, it allows us to make sure that, for example, we provide employment in our economic region. Um, you know, we support communities. Uh, us having uh, prosperity and the ability to trade our goods uh, with over here in Saskatchewan, we export to over 100 countries in the world. Um, you know, this, this allows us to um, create prosperity, not just on our farm, but in our region and for our province, for taxpayers. Um, and, you know, we, uh, so that, that's got social, and economic sustainability connected to it. Um, so, you know, we're, Saskatchewan's one of the world's largest exporters. Well, we are the world's largest exporter. Peas, lentils, wheat, canola, flax, mustard, oats. Um, we didn't have the export market. We wouldn't be producing food for the world. And uh, this is also connected very much to social sustainability is what would the world do if we weren't exporting all of that food to them? Um, so I think, I think I'll leave it at that, Michael. Yes, absolutely. I appreciate that. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we're running a little bit behind because of the technical difficulties. So we're going to move on to the next video. Uh, up next, we have a, a shorter video from Alfredo Gutierrez, a farmer in Mexico. My name is Alfredo Gutierrez. I'm a fifth generation dairy farmer. As an agronomist, one of my mainly objecti objectives is the production of crops, especially forage for the cows. Uh, like sorghum, corn, barley, wheat, rye grass. Uh, our main objective is to keep and preserve all natural resources like water, soil, like using a specialized technology, for example, the specialized machinery, 
the use of drones on weather station. All of these to, to, to produce high quality forages, to produce high quality milk. Hi Alfredo, thank you very much for that. I appreciate that. Uh, it's helpful to kind of Hi, know what you do and what, what you're talking about and how you farm. Um, uh, knowing, you know, given that you're a dairy farmer and you are kind of uh, in charge of the crop section, uh, you I think can provide a, uh, a kind of a, a larger perspective on some of the agriculture that uh, is going on in, in Mexico. Uh, the first question I wanted to talk to you about uh, is uh, the fact that you know, the Mexican government seems to be making some, you know, very um, uh, strong decisions around biotechnology and pesticide use. Uh, that you know, some uh, some of the farmers that we've been talking to, especially some of the farmers within the Global Farmer Network, uh, are not in support of, um, and you know, it also may be having an impact on trade. Uh, are you concerned about the availability, availability of innovations and technologies uh, that you need uh, for your operation, both on the crop side as well as on the dairy side? Well, yes. Uh, here in Mexico, the prohibition of biotech and some other chemicals is not affecting directly our production because they are limiting the tools to produce food and it just is starting. You know, if this keeps going sooner, they are going to have to get more and more chemicals leaving us without tools to produce, which will lead to an agriculture like, like we were in, were in like 1950s. Uh, especially we don't have access to BT corn. Right now there is a huge movement to glyphosate, to ban glyphosate from from Mexico and according to our government to 2024 we have no longer glyphosate or roundup uh, so that's really difficult for us they are keeping our weight tools so making us to produce a lot harder uh, with higher costs and it's, it's really a big big concern but unfortunately uh, we as farmers, we cannot do anything because I think that uh, wrong people are sitting the, in the big chair. So it's going to be a really tough years. Hopefully it will change in the next year. So let's see what, what happens. So what will that mean for you in the short and medium term? And we don't really know the long term effects because we don't really know what decisions will be made. But in the short and medium term, how will that have an impact on your ability to farm and the sustainability of your operations? It will affect directly because uh, in case of uh, the ban of Roundup or glyphosate, we will have to use more agrochemicals, different agrochemicals, maybe more machinery. So we are going to, uh, it would cost a lot more, like more chemicals, more machinery, more labor. So our Profitably will go down. Uh, many farmers will have to shut down, I think. So, yeah, it will be a really, really tough years uh, next year here in Mexico. Uh, I talked a little bit to Elena about uh, the issue of trade. You know, how do some of these decisions coming out of your government uh, affect trade, both from an import as well as a, an export uh, matter? That's another really big issue. Uh, we depend on the on the imports and exports. Uh, Mexico uh, Mexico exports a lot of food, especially uh, like fruits and vegetables. But for animal feed, we need to import almost everything: uh, soybeans, corn from the U.S., canola from Canada. So we need to stick to those agreements and we need to get better agreements so we have availability to all of those feeds to all the inputs uh, unfortunately like i said the wrong people are seeing the big chair so we have to struggle with that uh, the different uh, years and for us like farmers uh, especially for me like we produce milk uh, our crops are more important than ever because if we don't have access to those inputs we have to produce more with less Mm -hmm. And you know, as you know, you you know, as you lose the ability to import the uh, the, the the food for your animals, uh, will that cause an increase in price for your operations? And if so, 
uh, will will that have an impact on food security for the Mexican people? Yes, actually, we are having a lot of issues right now uh, because our government is trying to. They they want to be like uh, auto sustainable to grow, uh, especially corn, but we are not sufficient. So we have to import a lot. So this this year our cost has going higher, and many people are like I said, it's going to shut down, uh, or we are like we are struggling really hard. So I don't know what's going to happen. So if you had to, if you had to say one thing to the leaders of your government that will kind of to tell your story or to to tell them your concerns, you know, what would you say to the leaders of your government uh, to try to uh, resolve some of these issues? Please hear us. We know how to do things. We know how to do things the right way. We know how to farm the land. We know how to grow crops. We know how to produce uh, animal feed. Let do. Uh, Please let let us do that and hear us because they made the agreements and the trades sitting in the chair and they don't know anything about farming. So that's the real big issue. The wrong people are writing and everything in the paper is really good, but in the reality, in the farms, everything's quite different. So please hear us and let us do our part. I think that's a great message. I think for all you know, policymakers, is, as Alana, as Alana mentioned, that the policy is the big issue facing a lot of farmers, and I think that uh, a, a farmers around the world would have very similar things to say. Just listen to us, take our advice, yeah. and uh, let us do our job. Yeah, thank you very much, Alfredo. I appreciate that. Uh, moving you. on, uh, we're going to be uh, going on to the next video, uh, which is a. Uh, uh, video from a farmer in Uruguay, uh, Gabriel Caballal. Hi, I am Gabriel Carvajal, a farmer from Uruguay, South America, and I belong to the Global Farmer Network organization since 2012. I am farming more than 3,000 acres in the southwest part of Uruguay, and I believe in a regenerative agriculture, in a positive agriculture, where the impact is good for me and for the environment, where I can catch CO2 from the atmosphere and fix into the soil, where I can leave a better soil at the end than the soil I found when I started. That is why you can see things like this in my fields. No till in 100% of the area, high carbon crops like this corn just harvested, cover crops in all the area where no winter crop is being planted, and a great system of nutrition for these crops. We want to improve the environment, we want to improve the soil, we want to have something better at the end than the beginning. And that is why we are so convinced in what we are doing here. Crop rotation is really, really important for us too. It's really important for our system. In this case, for example, we have a first crop corn with a cover crop planted before corn harvest with an airplane. Then we will plant a first crop soybean, then a rape seed. After that rape seed, a second crop soybean, and after that, another winter crop like wheat or, or, or barley and after that wheat or barley we will plant probably a second crop corn so all that rotation system plus the production system we are using which is no-till plus the nutrition of, of each and every crop creates a healthy system which improves the soil and for me if the soil is happy if the soil is healthy I am happy I, and I am wealthy too. For me, it's very important to tell this story because I know that one farmer by itself is not going to change the world. But if, if we all together know this technology and know that we are doing well, we can probably make something if we work together in this. For example, here, 
you have a corn crop, right? Which yielded more than seven tons per hectare. After a barley crop, which yielded more than six tons per hectare. If we think in all the carbon we fix it from the atmosphere to the ground, to the soil, improving the soil at the same time we are improving the environment, I think that's, that's incredible. So telling this story to the rest of the world, telling this story to the farmers and taking it is really, really important for me. And that's why the Global Farmer Networks for me is a great organization. Uh, so sounds like we're having some audio How are you? issues. I'm good. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Uh, I love that in your video you talked a lot, a lot about some of the issues Please. that the the public may have some concerns with. Uh, and I do apologize because we're having a little bit of connectivity issues here. So uh, just in advance, um, you know, you talked a lot about soil health. You talk a lot about no-till agriculture. You talk a lot about crop rotation. Uh, all of things, uh, all things that people, you know, say the, the general public or, you know, the people who are, you know, uh, criticizing agriculture saying that we should be, would be doing. Uh, and you talk a lot about in that, uh, of those things in your video. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about the importance of soil health and some of these other issues uh, on your farm? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Awesome. Loud and clear. Awesome. Thank you. Excellent. Well, we started with no-till back in the 80s with the idea of finding some solution to erosion. That was our goal at the beginning. And then we found, after starting with this uh, production system, we found a lot of advantages which tend to improve the soil, right? The idea was having a healthier soil that improves our production. So uh, we put a little spicy on this system after knowing it, like using cover crops, like using uh, GMOs, precision agriculture, uh, and collecting a lot of information, which improved even more this system, uh, which allowed us to have a more resilient production system with uh, the ability of farming in places where we are we were not uh, doing in the, in the past and with the ability of growing crops without destroying the fields that, that was the first goal was not destroying through erosion but we found that we were we were not only cutting erosion but also improving the system that was amazing and we are also improving the environment and we found that that uh, fixing carbon as I said in the video, from the atmosphere into the soil and keeping there through no tilling the soil, through organic matter increasing, well, that's that's incredible. That's that's what I call a win-win-win situation. You can improve your production, you can have a happier soil, and you can have a much better environment. That's that for me is, is incredible. Uh, yes, I mean it definitely seems like. You know, you're having a lot of success on your farm with the, the innovations, the technologies, and the techniques that you're using. Um, you know, what would you say to you know people around the world who may not have access to some of those techniques or those um, the tools that you use? I mean, what what kind of things would you wish that others had access to? Well. Uh... We usually put uh, barriers in front of us when we don't know a technology, right? Uh, what I say is, you know the technology and you try to apply, maybe through all machinery or through all techniques you might have already, and you will find that this is, for me, a great solution for several things. Resilience, sustainability, those are major improvements using this kind of technology. So. Uh, it, it's more in, in here, the, the problem, the barrier, the, 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 is, is more in, in our heads than in, in, in the actual solutions we might find around us. When we started here back in, in the 80s, in the late 80s, we had no machinery adapted to, to plant in a no-till system. We had uh, glyphosate was uh, like uh, 40 times more expensive than now. So technology was not on our side. Technology was against us. And what we did is 
well, let's try to take this to where I want to go to, to achieve our goals. And, and then the, the results were so far better than everything was uh, done all itself, right? So if you have no technology, for example, no machinery uh, suitable for, for no-till farming, well, probably there's a way of converting that machinery to a no-till planter, let's say, to, to make it possible. Yep, exactly. I appreciate that. So I think that you know everybody on this panel is innovative and they're committed to best practices in, in agriculture and care deeply about the land that you're going to be passing on to future generations. Um, you know, is this you know common or is this uh, kind of adapted by a lot of the farmers in your area, uh, or are you kind of the pioneers of these types of techniques? Uh, and hoping that others, with even within your own uh, country and region, uh, will also be uh, adopting. Well, a, a number that shows that is uh, in Uruguay, no-till um, adoption is above ninety percent of the area. So I, I, I could say all Uruguay is under no-till systems, <laughs> which is great because when when my father started, my father was one of the founders of the national. association mm -hmm. they, they were called like crazy farmers because everybody else saw them they, they were looking for something un undoable right and now Uruguay is above 90 percent in adoption so that's great here in this country Argentina Brazil uh, no deal is is a reality and is, is in most of the areas there are other countries uh, especially in Europe where this technology has not been adapted and I believe it's a major change, but I believe also it's a, it's a major improvement, especially to the soil, which is where all our system is based. So uh, it takes, as I said, some mind changes uh, to adapt our... We, we have been doing this since ever. Why changing right now? Well, I, I believe the results pay, pay the effort. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. And uh, actually, it's a very good transition. Thank you for teeing that up for me because our next video is from a European farmer. Uh, next up, we'll have a uh, short video from uh, Danish farmer Nuth Beismith. Hi there. My name is Knut Beismith and I'm a farmer from Denmark. Our farm is a purely arable farm on which we grow uh, cereal, oil seed, legume and sometimes some grass seed. I joined the Global Farmer Network in 2017 after I had followed their work on the internet for some years. I really like the idea of sharing knowledge and having insight in rural life across borders worldwide. As a farmer within the uh, e European Union am I on the one hand blessed with a relative stable market and infrastructure. For me, is the stability the most important value of the European Union? Historically, there have been many conflicts in Europe. But on the other hand, it's my feeling that the European Union is going backward now, at least with what is related to agriculture. EU's new Green Deal still wanders to promote old-fashioned extreme tillage as the solution to, the, to today's hot topic. Um, we restrain from the use of any sort of gene technology. We are still stuck in repeating the same old mantra about this breeding tool. The use of uh, no-till is struggling to be accepted as a practice uh, that can contribute to solve some of the challenge that is on the agenda these years. We are a small group of farmers in Denmark who is practicing no-till and none of us would like to go back to the plough again. Hopefully the, f the, the fact will support us and the concept will be seen as a part of the solution to handle some of the challenge uh, food production leaves. Anyhow, then I still believe that there is room for farming in Denmark based on common sense. Hi, Gnud. Thank you very much for that. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Great, great. Thank you very much for that perspective. It's uh, one that we don't necessarily always hear in the 
the larger uh, scheme of things. Um, you know, you've been farming since 1987, yeah. and you have seen a lot of changes in agriculture over the past uh, 35 years or so. Uh, in the direction of GMOs, lots of changes in crop protection tools and other inputs, digital technology and more. How has agriculture within the EU changed compared with the rest of the world? Uh, how it will or how it has? Uh, well, both, I guess. Okay. Um, how it has, I mean, it, it has, uh, particularly within the, the use of gene technology, we uh, we have uh, deselected that for, for 30 years now, which means that we, uh, yeah, we have been without that um, benefits that, which could have contributed to a lot. And, and uh, even one thing is what uh, it could have done with those um, crops who is available but the next thing is or the most important thing is what it could have been if it has been available within crops that is more traditional here in, in my part of Europe northern Europe uh, one can only guess so so in the future if if we still uh, keep that policy which it seems like we will with the uh, green deal we will just be even more left behind. Uh, that is unfortunately how I see it. And what do you think, um, you know, uh, are there, there options in farmers in other countries that you wish that you had in you know, your country and the, the rest of the EU? And conversely, you know, what are some of the techniques that maybe uh, you wish people, farmers around the world would adopt that uh, you're currently using in, in the EU? Um, if um, if we start with what uh, farmers around the globe could use from Denmark, uh, not so much from the rest of the Europe, but but as I see from Denmark, it should be better education, basically better education of, of farmers. That that would definitely improve a lot worldwide. Uh, there we could contribute from from Denmark, I'm sure. Uh, and and what I'm missing is as what I'm starting with is is simply the better breeding tools which uh, only the fantasy can imagine what it could lead us to and then knowing that a part of the green deal is talking about less use of pesticide and uh, more self-sufficient with protein and and uh, i can't see we can reach that goal without also using a newer breeding technology otherwise it will take us several generations to to reach that so that's how i see it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um so with the uh, the issue you know farm to fork the new the, the green deal you know heading you know, for uh being discussion right now in europe uh, you know we talked to gabriel about you know passing his farm down for future generations you know how do you feel about being able to pass your farm or agriculture for future generations in Europe? Is it gonna, uh, is the face of agriculture gonna change? Or what do you think will agriculture look like in Europe uh, over the next 30 to 50 years? Yes, uh, hopefully not uh, like uh, the worst scenario in case the Green Deal is being implemented as, as, the, as the goal is, because then it will be a working museum here in Europe, and and uh, yeah, but uh, some some people in Europe find that we can afford to have uh, the rest of the world to supply us with food because we will be less and less self-sufficient with food uh, for sure. And passing on the farms, I mean, there is a lot of land being taken out of production in Denmark, so so there will be less and less farmland to pass on as farmland. Of course, mm -hmm. the land will be there. So, so it's a it's a little bit uh, egoistic to the way we farm in in northern Europe, uh, as I see it. Uh, yeah, but uh, hopefully that uh, common sense will will overtake, and and it won't be as bad mm -hmm. as it, as it seems from my point of view. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. So, what do you think your hopes are on that? I mean, what do you think? You know, what do you think the odds are? Uh, on that, I mean, are you hopeful that, that you'll be able to get these things? Or are you a little bit more pessimistic about the future? 
uh, it's it's strange, but uh, you know, just before this uh, new crisis with higher energy prices and uh, and so on, I, I was fearing that it was going that way. But but I think that with with this uh, wake up call from you know with with particularly energy prices, which means higher mm -hmm. fertilizer prices, will 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 uh, hopefully open the eyes of the politicians that. Uh, we uh, we can't just live uh, in this illusion. We have to produce uh, something here in Europe as well, and then just mm -hmm. be better to do it without uh, leaving too much impact. That is that is for me the way to go instead of shutting everything down. Sure, sure. Yep, makes sense. All right, uh, we've got about ten minutes left of the call, and at this point, I think I'd like to invite everybody back uh, up onto the screen to share their cameras. And hopefully we will actually be able to get uh, Senator Roberts uh, on the call as well for him to be able to provide uh, some uh, kind of some closing thoughts and uh, talk about a little bit about his uh, what he would have talked about had he uh, not had some te te technical uh, issues. So Senator Roberts, uh, will you be able to uh, uh, join in? Right now you're on mute. All right, looks like we may have lost Senator Roberts uh, for that. Uh, so now that I have everybody back together, if he if he uh, comes back, uh, we will certainly uh, toss it back to him. Uh, but for the sake of the audience, I would do want to keep this conversation going. Uh, one question that we kind of talked about a little bit earlier, uh, but I kind of wanted to get a bigger perspective is kind of your thoughts on uh, climate change, you know, with COP26 uh, coming up. It's here, not here. So it sounds like we have Go Senator ahead. Roberts on audio, but not on video right now. Uh, yes, uh, can you hear, uh, hear me now, Michael? We can hear you. We can't see you, but I think we would love to hear uh, your thoughts <laughs> on this. So if you can join us, absolutely, please go there ahead. Go. There you are. Okay, can yes. you hear me? I'm yep. sorry for we have about eight minutes minutes left, we went so, through. Yep. I think that was an excellent presentation. The thing that strikes me about all farmers, all producers, regardless of crop, and now it's very evident all across the world, uh, that um, uh, amazing in, in terms of innovation and resilience and optimism, uh, the farmer would never put the seed in the ground, uh, regardless of the crop, if he or she did not think um, that, that they were going to have a crop, regardless of what governments do, regardless of uh, what the green situation is, uh, which in many cases is very counterproductive. This has been a very interesting webinar. Um, as a chairman, both in the House and the Senate in the United States Congress of the Agriculture Committees, it's been a real pleasure uh, to listen, especially to uh, to all of you and answering your uh, questions. I can't remember which one said, well, what we need is a lot of common sense. Uh, I think that will come as the price of food keeps rising because of the COVID situation all the way around the world and the supply chain problems that we've had. But I've been very impressed. I want to ask Alina if you could tell me the name of that beautiful dog that you had there in that lovely wheat <laughs> field. His name is Buck. He's a good black lab, good farm dog. Uh, it looks like a great dog. I, I think uh, I think Knud really hit the nail on the head. Here we have no-till. We've had no-till in the United States ever since 1996. Why on earth uh, just a few farmers uh, have banded together and said, we're not going to use the plow anymore. It's not needed. Uh, you know, we can do our business very fine uh, without that. The, the question I would have of him, what's the chances of that happening? Uh, you mean to, to get the plow back or, or continue with no-till? Yes, to continue no-till. Um, it is. Uh, it's. It's funny to say, but uh, luckily the 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 you know the 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 science is behind us. With with tillage means uh, decomposing and then letting the carbon to the atmosphere, and and so far is the only herbicide available is glyphosate. So it's like you can choose between tillage, which means decomposition of, of the soil, or you could accept a few liters of glyphosate per hectare per year. 
So, so I think the common sense will will leave us with the glyphosate, uh, but it will it will be a long uh, emotional debate uh, for getting to there. Well, so, what I don't understand, and I think that's probably the biggest problem, is that uh, the number one issue, or one of the number one issues we have in the United States, is uh, uh, carbon sequestration. That is nothing new. Uh, we were talking about that several decades ago, but we did not get to the uh, situation where now it is the number one item trying to figure out what part does the federal government pay, what part do uh, does private enterprise play, and then obviously what part does the producer play. Uh, right now it's um, in a state of flux, but it is the most popular thing to achieve uh, in the eyes of folks who are really paying attention to this, the kind of progress we can make in taking more carbon out of the air. What I think the simplest thing to describe is carbon in the air, bad carbon in the, in the soil, good. The problem that we have here right now, there are about eight or nine conservation practices that, that you can employ, and then that they then would be uh, authorized by the federal government. And then, but to date, we have not seen how that's going to work. In the meantime, we have had a great number of industries already pay farmers for carbon sequestration, trying to get ahead of the uh, uh, of the game, if you will, and uh, some more than others. And uh, so that's going to have to be worked out. Uh, I would imagine, hopefully, that we could do that in at least a year's time. And uh, I would hope in each of your areas that we would have the same kind of cooperation where they would, uh, uh, what is it, wake up and smell the roses or wake up and smell the no-tail. Actually, there's no smell to it. But uh, anyway, thank you very much uh, for this international look at the same problems that we're experiencing all over the world. The key to this is that we always say we are uh, producing the best food that we possibly can for our own countries, but also for a troubled and hungry world. And that's doing nothing but getting more serious. Maybe that is the answer if we can really focus on that and say this is, we, th this is the way we can do it best. And then with the help of uh, uh, crop life and people on the, uh, uh, really on the edge of change and uh, uh, crop life I've been associated with now for gosh 40 years and uh, they've always been right on the cusp in terms of helping farmers ranchers and growers <clears throat> with uh, with everything that uh, uh, that has come at us with uh, 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 with regard with the challenge I wish you all the very best and uh, keep doing what you're doing your wonderful examples of not only um, what you're doing but your country as well and uh, I don't know, Knud, and maybe I'll have to come to Denmark and talk to your uh, legislature. You will be very welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Michael, for, for conducting, I think, a wonderful uh, webinar. I apologize for the glitches. Um, I won't go into that. There were, it's a good <laughs> thing that the sound wasn't on. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, well, Senator Roberts, I mean, we do have a little bit more time. If you, uh, if there's more that you'd like to say or more questions that you'd like to ask the people, uh, we can go over a little bit since we did have the late start. We may drop some audience, but uh, since this is being recorded, uh, certainly we can uh, provide video right. for people later on as well if you'd like to continue on. I would like to ask all of our wonderful uh, participants, uh, in your view, what is your number one problem and number two if you have an answer to that problem uh, or what you think would be best to do that why don't we start off with elena thanks senator well at risk of uh, repeating myself uh, because obviously on the farm we have lots of challenges related to um, you know marketing technology all kinds of production challenges uh, you know weather variability uh, but uh, as I said earlier in the discussion, I, I think my number one uh, concern on the farm is policy. And, uh, you know, this is misguided, misinformed, uh, you know, non-science based policy that I fear sometimes governments are tempted to, uh, to move towards. Um, you know, we've been fortunate in Canada that uh, certainly the province I live in, in 
and and to a certain degree even our federal government has taken a science-based approach to policy but i do worry about some of the signals we're seeing on um, you know non-science-based decision making certainly some pressure from consumers because maybe we in agriculture haven't done our part in explaining what we do and why we do it and how interested we are in being sustainable and regenerating our soil and, and using the best practices because of innovation. And uh, so this pressure from consumers maybe has pushed governments to make wrong decisions. But I, I really think governments need to have good policy so that we can sustainably produce crops for the world. Thank you, Gabrielle, you're next. What do you think is the number one problem that you're facing and then uh, what's the answer? We have sound science uh, and then also the policy of, of governments to recognize that sound science. That's right, that's right. Please. I agree with Elena in terms that policy is the, the main problem here too. Um, we want uh, we, we we have facts that we know are true but some people it's not based on science but they take decisions and that's a big problem because they make decisions based on fears based on thoughts and that's no good i i always believe in science and i believe that the science is proving something we have to follow that way so i, I would say policy and the way some other people is facing agriculture is the main problem that's that's why i always say that the farmer must go and tell their story because it's the way of telling what's happening today now in in the farm and telling the other people how it works and why we do something and what we do to make them understand how is it going on here in the farm that certainly is an ongoing challenge alfredo I, just like Gabriel and Alana said, it's policies. The wrong people are making the laws and they don't hear us. So that's, that's the main trouble we have. And uh, wrapping up in fourth place, but uh, my, uh, my no-tail person here, uh, Knud. Um, I probably just repeat the three others, but Basically, the biggest challenge is to work out which way the wind is blowing. Uh, one thing is what you hear when you follow the, on the social media and, and what the goal is, which is, is the climate change. Uh, but then living in the European Union, back to the Green Deal, I mean, we, we don't walk the talk. We, we, we talk a lot about what we do, but we walk in another direction. So it's, it's, it's very contradictory with what the goal is and what the tools we are using to reach the goal. So, so that is um, yeah, that is the challenge. But how to solve it? Uh, uh, I I hope that science will will support us. I hope common sense. Otherwise, there is only the hard way. That is uh, that is uh, you know if 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 the if the poorest part of European folks cannot afford the daily meal, I know it will change. Then then we are going back to produce food for affordable cost with less impact and not just a little story. Yeah. Well, Michael, I think, and then all of the panelists, um, I want to make sure you understand that the very same uh, summary of concerns is shared by every farmer, rancher, and, uh, and grower in the United States. Uh, we obviously have a lot of, of territory uh, as well as Canada, but uh, it's always amazing to me the ever-present job of trying to educate uh, a very urban uh, uh, population, uh, plus all of the uh, all of the activists involved, just on the basics of farming and what makes sense, and then if you can possibly apply that to sound science. Uh, right now, we are in the midst of uh, something called the Green New Deal, and uh, it doesn't have these things don't have to be at odds they can be commensurate we all could be headed in the right direction uh, michael thank you so much for having crop life sponsor this i think this is uh, very educational i think this is going to uh, really get a lot of attention uh, certainly in the united states but also worldwide over and thank you to you all and uh, bless your heart uh, good luck if you need rain i hope you get it if you don't i hope you don't <laughs> 
Thank okay. you. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Senator Roberts. Appreciate that. Thank you for all of our panelists for today. And to all of the attendees, we'll be sending out a link to the video uh, on YouTube once it's available. And I would like to thank uh, everybody for joining. And if you're continuing on with the, the World Food Prize events and some of the other uh, uh, Borlaug Dialogues activities, uh, good luck uh, for the rest of the week as well. Thank you very much for joining us today.